Hey there, I'm Dara, and in this video, I'm going to show you how I made this electric velvet arrangement. This is a smaller than usual arrangement, and I'm very excited to show you because I've gotten a couple of requests asking to do this kind of video. So here we have it. We've got the electric velvet tutorial for you today. And here we have a list of the materials that you'll need to make this arrangement today. You can go ahead and screen grab this for easy access, or you can access it in the description box below. I have everything listed there as well. So I've got this little section on super high speed. If you'd like to know how to do this part, it is how to tube and stake orchids. And I will leave the link for you up in the right hand corner. Go ahead and click that if you need to watch how to tube and stake orchids. But for brevity's sake, we've got hyacinth sticks, number 57 tubes, and two different types of orchids. I've got Vanda and Cymbidium here today. Now we've got Coxcomb Celosia, super gorgeous. And I'm gonna show you here, see this huge stem? This is something you're gonna to wanna to look out for when you're purchasing the ball coxcomb. Look at the stems, turn the bunch upside down, look at the stems, look at the width of the stems. You're going to want to look for bunches and stems that have the least amount of width to them as possible. Out of three or five bunches that I purchased about, which is five stems per, per bunch, about three stems came like that, those extra wide stems, and um, you can still use them. It's just a lot more work around. So if you can avoid those types of stems, that is just easier work for you. Otherwise, you would have to kind of shave them down and make sure that you're shaving them down at the right angle. And then just remember that those parts would not be submerged in water. So overall, it's just good to look for bunches that have as skinny a stem as possible. Not so skinny that it would, the heads would um, break the stem and bend it over, but just enough so that it will fit into that little honeycomb opening in our galvanized chicken wire dome. If you've watched any of the how to make pave arrangements, it goes into full detail on how to do that, but I will also link that up here for you in the right if you need to know how to make this galvanized chicken wire dome. I explain this in detail, but basically I created this method because I moved away from using Oasis many years ago and I needed to create a method that would not only allow me to continue creating this specific style of pave arrangement, but also have it be properly in water. I, I feel like I'm pretty much 90% of the way there with the kind of style arrangement that I want to make. There are some benefits to Oasis, but we don't want to use Oasis. If anything, we would maybe want to try AgroWool. If you've used AgroWool in the past, please let me know in the comments below if you like working with AgroWool. I'm um, gonna see if I can get a hold of that material to make a first impressions unboxing demonstration with that or video for you to see how it goes. Um, I think for certain methods and applications it will be useful, but what I've seen other florist tutorials talking about this, I, I'm not sure that it would work for these, uh, this style arrangement. So let me know in the comments below if you've worked with AgroWool and if you like it and what you use it for. So now I'm going in with this amazing rose called Tycoon. It's like a gorgeous creamsicle color. And on the tips of some of the outer petals, there's this little almost watercolor-like brush mark on the tips of the petals. It's just so pretty. It's got like a little bit of a darker orange water brush, watercolor mark there. And I'm just go going in and making small clusters with these Tycoon roses. And so I've gotten a couple of requests now to do smaller arrangements with more affordable uh, blooms and 
this is my way of doing that. So as you can see, I started off making the overall shape with the coxcomb, leaving spaces where I know what the general dimension of the roses are and what kinds of clusters, clusters I want to make with those roses. So I very deliberately left open spaces so that I could put in these particular types of clusters. And uh, then when at the end of the, the arrangement, when I have a little bit more space, I'll go in and fill in with whatever's left of the coxcomb if necessary. But that's generally how I start all my arrangements. I start by making a general shape, mapping out uh, the sphere to make sure I'm getting the right shape down, and then go in and fill with my second largest flower, also mapping out a generalized shape, and then kind of go back and forth with the other types of blooms. So you can see here that I also went in with another type of orange rose. This one was called Orange Crush, another super classic primary orange rose. I love this one so much as well. Let's just call it what it is. I love, <laughs> I love all flowers. I love all flowers. I, it's really hard when I get asked the question, what's your favorite flower? It's a preposterous question to me, especially as a florist. Every season has its highlights. And um, as a lover of flowers, I just love them all. I do tend to use roses a lot. Uh, so if I had to choose a favorite flower, let's not even go there. But for a long time in the early 2000s when I was working for Floral Rush OG Flower Shop, my first, uh, well not my first, but the longest gig that I had in LA was almost seven years with a guy named Nelson. We did a lot of celebrities, homes, events, and award shows, and he was just a fabulous guy. But while working for him, I found it really interesting that people would specifically request no carnations. Like somewhere in the 90s, that became the tacky flower that no one wanted. And for good reason. I feel like a lot of those FTD teleflora arrangements, which I used to also make back in the 90s, had created this just very cheap, uh, tacky arrangement, usually with baby's breath or some sort of inexpensive filler like leather leaf, and it just got a bad rap. And designing for Nelson, I had the opportunity to really explore that and kind of open up our customers' minds to why Carnation was sh so chic and why they should reintegrate it into their floral rotation. First of all, they are just so beautiful. The ruffle, the texture to them, and there's so many varieties now. There's just an immense amount of varieties to choose from and colors to choose from, textures to choose from. There are double carnations, there are single carnations, and I, I'm used to truly just be obsessed with carnations. And then I was motivated by that rejection of it. I kind of made it this iconic, iconoclastic kind of emblem for my own work. And for the longest time, carnation was my favorite. So still really love carnation, but am not so steadfast about the fact that it's my favorite. Though I do use it in almost every arrangement, it is something that I love as an accent flower. It creates a nice uh, sectioning of, you can create groupings with carnations that makes a really beautiful, flattened kind of textural detail, which I love so much. And you just, you gotta have it, you know, especially with all of the different types that we have available today. So then I, started going in here and filling in some of those larger holes with the Vanda orchid and then the Cymbidium orchid. And I hope that you could tell that those also went into larger holes. I left, I started this video on regular speed. So this is actually uh, the speed at which I work. 
I think it's actually sped up to 150. So you could see slowly the pace at which I work and um, get a sense for what that actually looks like, um, what my hands are doing, how I'm working with the product. I hope that this is useful to you if you don't notice that much of a difference and you think that the other sped up tutorials are just as fine, let me know because shorter content can sometimes be better. Uh, there are certain things that I really do love a thorough explanation for, so I'm the type of person that will sit around and listen to a 30 minute tutorial on how to do something when I really love it. There are a couple of YouTuber examples that I just love that are non-flower related. There's a cook named Claire Saffitz that I just love so much, her dessert person show. And then another fellow New Hampshire gal named Alex Anelle. She's such an inspiration. She's super passionate about what she does and she's just teaching the people. But I'll, you know, just sit around and listen to her talk for 30 minutes. So are you that type of viewer? Are you the type of person that just likes to have something on in the background and learn a little bit of some, learn a little bit about something new and you kind of absorb the information perhaps while you're working or doing your exercise or whatever it is that you're doing? Or do you like prefer to sit down and watch the entire way through and watch how the thing is made as well as listen. Just curious uh, what the needs of the people are here that are watching. We hit uh, over 300 subscribers, which I'm super excited about. And <laughs> thank you so much for being here and for watching and learning along with me. I'm continuing to grow in my ability to create these videos. I am the only one uh, working to create this video. I film, edit, do the voiceover, color correct, and it's a huge learning curve for me as someone who is quite analog, someone who works with plants, but I love a good challenge and I'm really getting into it, I'm super loving it. So I just wanna hear if you have any comments whatsoever about um, what you would like to see more of, uh, what, yeah, just I'm open to thoughts and opinions. I am not precious about my work. I simply just want to get better. So with that, I would love uh, your thoughts and opinions if you have any. Do you love it? Do you hate it? What do you love? What do you hate? Let's get specific. So I do not have this particular size in my shop because as you know, or if you didn't know, I am a single person shop, meaning I have a private studio and I fulfill orders on a case by case basis. I do not keep fresh product sitting around in my studio. Therefore, every arrangement that I make is highly custom and extremely fresh. So I purchase all materials on a case by case basis. And then I, yeah, so with that also comes a certain minimum, meaning if I buy two different types of roses, I'm getting 50 types of, uh, 50 stems of roses, sorry. So I've had to be really strategic about how I design my offerings and most of my arrangements start at a medium size. As you know, also garden roses come in a 12 stem bunch, but they are uh, usually the same price if not actually double the cost of a standard Ecuadorian rose. These types of roses that I'm using in this arrangement are Ecuadorian garden roses are usually double the price and half the amount of product. So uh, yeah, so I end up with 50 stems if I'm making a small arrangement that's simply uh, just not doable. I wouldn't be able to offer a small arrangement size and price because then I would be left with a bunch of products and no profit on that arrangement. I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions about that, feel free to leave that below. Of course, happy to answer that for you. But if you're a beginner florist or if you're someone who's trying to strike out on your own and create your own offerings, this is something that you're definitely going to want to consider the amount of stems that come in each bunch, 
the types of designs that you will offer and what that stem count will be. And uh, yeah, tailoring your offerings based on the basic math of how flowers are done, knowing the quantities that come in each bunch and the pricing of it. So it's a highly time-consuming affair creating the price breakdown and the offerings, but as a designer and a business person, these are two extremely important things that you need to know when crafting your offerings. If you'd like to see more tutorials on the business side or how to design your own menu or design your own designs, also let me know in the comments below. Happy to walk you through my process of how I do that. But just so you know, this arrangement, I had had an order the day prior and I had the perfect amount of flowers left over from that. And then when I actually went to market to create a new offering for my store, I wanted to do a Solosia based arrangement. So it was just one solid mound of exquisite coxcomb, the ball coxcomb Solosia. It's in season right now and it's just so vibrant. It's one of my favorite highlights of the season. I just love the saturation of the color the texture of the flower, which is like, it's velvet. It's just straight up velvet. Does that not, <laughs> does that not blow your mind? It's my favorite, favorite thing ever. Uh, the fact that nature makes these incredible creatures and then we get to experience them is just honestly mind blowing. So I wanted to create a coxcomb arrangement. That didn't happen. I got an order for a small arrangement, which usually never happens. And then here we go. I was able to use up the rest of that leftover product, which of course still looked great. If you work in a flower shop, you have product sitting around for about a week and then you sometimes send that product out. Of course, hopefully the product is in refrigeration and cooler storage so that it's maintaining longevity. But again, that's another thing with the flower shop strategy is a lot of flower shops keep their product in, in coolers at too cool a temperature and then the arrangements that the recipients receive are really only last for about three to five days. With my method, though it is a lot more tedious and quite frankly, probably more work, doing orders on a case-by-case -case basis uh, allows you to give your clients the absolute most for the money. They'll get super fresh product and the longest lasting product as well. I am finishing off this arrangement. I'm just going down at the bottom lip of that arrangement and making sure that none of the mechanics are exposed. Uh, if you can see any chicken wire, any tape, which you really shouldn't because it's on the upper brim of the lip of the vase, just make sure that you're going in and putting any flowers or if you use foliage, uh, go ahead and put that in. But again, if you've been here for a minute, you know that I, for my pave arrangements, generally do not use greenery. And uh, yeah, I just, I just love this so, so much. <laughs> Super grateful. This arrangement was done for a friend named Kalea. She is an exquisite dancer located in Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Kalea. If you're watching this, I really appreciate your support. I'm just finishing off this arrangement with more of that orange crush rose. If you were to create this arrangement, you could go to Trader Joe's and get a dozen of each different colored rose if you want, or if you just wanted to go straight up all one color to save yourself some money on that, you could always do that too. You don't have to do the two different colors, but I just think it adds a nice variety and dimension. And plugging in more of these Vanda blooms, just tidying up this design and making sure that if there's any blank spots, so to speak, that they are filled. And it's looking gorgeous. I love this. I am clearly struggling to get that in here. That does happen with the style arrangement, but 
so be it. I mean, that's just the nature of floral design. Sometimes you may be struggling to get a stem where you want it to be, but uh, in the end, it's worth it and it all comes together and it looks amazing. So what do you think? Do you love this arrangement? Are you, <laughs> are you just as crazy about it as I am? I am obsessed. I love it so much. This is pretty much along the lines of what I was going to make for my store, but I was going to be more simplified. And now we're finishing with Finishing Touch by Floral Life. I give that a vigorous shake and then spray up and down, twirling the arrangement on that Lazy Susan about five times or so. Give it a nice twirl. And it then has a nice fine mist over top it, helping to seal in moisture. And here we have it. Here's the finished look. What do you guys think of this small pave arrangement? Is this something that you're going to make? If you do make it, please tag me in your videos or posts and we'll see you in the next episode. All of the tools that I used to design this arrangement can be found in my Amazon store linked below. And thank you so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Leave me any comments or suggestions below. Thanks again.